So hey everyone, my name is Krish Kotru. I'm a physicist at Atom Computing. I'm also an engineering manager. Uh, and in this talk, I'm gonna be telling you about how we are building scalable quantum computers from arrays of neutral atoms. So I wanna set the stage for the talk by just emphasizing that we're very excited at Atom about pursuing large scale quantum computation. Uh, and we wanna do that by achieving error correction so that we can really take advantage of the, the long-term benefits of quantum, quantum computing. So why are we so excited about neutral atom qubits at Atom? So here's my sort of top four reasons for why I like neutral atoms. Reason number one, atoms occur identically in nature and they're very stable. And so what this means is you don't have to worry about manufacturing your qubits. And you also can be, be sure that if you treat your qubits well, uh, they will be stable and achieve, they'll give you long coherence times as, as I'll show you later in this talk. Reason number two, uh, is that uh, it's very easy to achieve large qubit counts, at least by today's standards. So if you look in the literature, you'll find that it's relatively straightforward for groups to run with tens to hundreds of neutral atom qubits uh, in ways that are totally consistent with doing quantum computation. Reason number three, uh, we can do wireless gates and wireless position control. There's an example of wireless position control in this GIF that you see in the top right. Um, these are both very powerful. Wireless gates are, are nice when you scale up your architecture because you don't really have to worry about cabling issues. And position control is great because you can change your connectivity diagram on the fly and potentially really improve uh, the, the, the gate compilation for your quantum circuit. Reason number four is that we have strong interactions that are disposable for fast two qubit gates. And those are based on the Rydberg interaction. But importantly, those interactions can be turned off very strongly when we don't want them to be there. Uh, and that allows us to go back to case number one where our qubits are very stable. So with that, let's talk about what a neutral atom qubit physically looks like. Okay, so here's my single atom. Uh, I want that to be my qubit in the end. Uh, what I start, uh, what I do first is I protect this atom from its environment by putting it inside of a, a vacuum chamber where the pressure is very low on the inside. So this prevents sources of quantum decoherence, like for example, background gas collisions. Then I need to keep the atom fixed in space. And so for that, I introduce a focused laser beam such that the atom is pulled towards the intensity maximum of this beam. And now I have an atom that's protected from its environment and fixed in space. But where is the qubit in all this? So the qubit is actually inside the atom, so to speak. And what I mean by that is if you look at our atoms, strontium 87, we have this compl complicated energy level structure, which I'm kind of giving you an example of on the right. Uh, we really don't care about all these levels when it comes to the qubit. We really, we really just want to pick two of the most stable levels that we can find. And so we're going to do that by choosing two of the nuclear, uh, nuclear spin ground states in strontium-87. So these levels on the bottom are going to define our qubit. Okay, so how do we scale this architecture up? So we saw that we have for, for a single spot of light, we can trap one atom. Well, for many atoms, we just need more spots of light. And that's pretty much what we do. But the thing is that we don't need many new lasers for more spots of light. We just take a single laser, that's hopefully a reasonable amount of power, and we divide it into many spots like you see here. And we can do that with two flavors of technologies that I'll just quickly describe here. Option one is an acousto-optic deflector, or AOD, and option two is, an, is a spatial light modulator, or an SLM. So for the AOD, what I do is I send my light through the AOD, and then I image it at the plane of the atoms. And then by applying individual tones of RF to the AOD with different frequencies, I can basically map each RF tone to the location of each spot that you see in this diagram. So it's a very programmable way of introducing more spots of light. For the spatial light modulator, it's a slightly different flavor where I take a chip, this SLM, and I bounce the light off of it. And then again, I image that light on, onto the plane of the atoms. Now, each pixel on this chip, I can program a slightly different phase shift such that I create a spatial phase profile for my laser beam. Now I can program the phases for each pixel and uh, looking into the imaging plane of that optical system, I can then basically create arbitrary patterns of light. For example, the spot array of spots that you see in this diagram. So what about gates? Uh, the answer is sort of more of the same. <laughs> we take acousto-optic deflectors, we send the gate light through that, and then we apply RF tones to the AODs to target specific atoms that we want to drive with our gates, like you see in this diagram with the two red columns of light. And then we also should talk about imaging. How do we measure? So basically we take pictures of the atom and, and here's an example where I've taken 100 images and averaged them. And 
basically the way we do this is we take our trapped atoms, we apply some resonant light, and that causes the atoms to fluoresce. So we use a microscope objective to collect some of that light. And then we just image that light onto a very sensitive camera. And basically, if you, if you take an average of those images, you'll see a, a grid of spots that looks like this, where each point of light corresponds to the location of a specific atom. OK, so we've now seen um, kind of uh, an abstract picture of the various elements of our quantum computer. But I want to introduce some realism into this. And basically, I want to tell you what that means is I want to tell you about the machine that we use at Berkeley, which we call Phoenix. So let's do our deep dive into Phoenix, okay? So this is what Phoenix looks like in our lab in Berkeley right now. Um, and what does Phoenix actually do? Well, the first thing it has to do is it has to go from this chunk of strontium, solid strontium metal, something that I can buy online, <laughs> and I need to, Phoenix needs to turn it into this grid of uh, individually trapped atoms that you see on the right. So how do we do this? Well, step one is we put, uh, we put the chunk of metal inside a vacuum system. We put it inside an oven actually. So we get the oven really hot. This makes some of the strontium metal vaporize. We poke a hole in the side of the oven so that an atomic beam flies out of it. So now we've got this fast moving atomic beam. It's very hot and we need to slow it down before we can trap it. So we actually send the beam through three stages of cooling, uh, which, are which are listed here on the bottom. And basically all three of these uh, levels of cooling involve using optical forces of light to slow the beam down more and more in, and also in more and more dimensions, spatial dimensions. So finally, after the third stage of cooling, what we have is a cold, dense cloud of atoms. And what we wanna do is overlap that cloud with uh, our, our focused spots of light or optical tweezers. And when we do that, and if you take pictures of the atoms at this stage, you'll get, the, you'll, you'll get what you see in this GIF here where you have sort of randomly loaded traps with individual atoms. Uh, and so what this means is we have single atoms. So the next step then is we need to rearrange these. This, what we see here is not super useful for quantum computing yet. So what we wanna do is actually create a uniformly filled grid of atoms. And the way we do that is by just literally rearranging their position in a very deterministic way. So there are a few different options for doing this and we've chosen to do it using the option in the yellow box. Okay? And so what that means is we're using acousto-optic deflectors. And more specifically, we're sending a laser beam again through the AOD and imaging that onto the plane of the atoms. And that's sort of what this red cone of light represents in this diagram. And then we're gonna use RF tones applied to the AOD to move the spot, of light, the spot of light around. So you can imagine actually sending a frequency that lets you pick up the atom uh, and then sweeping that RF frequency so that the atom can be dragged to a new location. And then you could let go of the atom uh, at a place where another trap exists already. Okay, and so in this way, you just keep doing this over and over again eventually have a uniformly filled grid. And so here's a GIF, the one on the left, showing this process uh, like sort of unfurling in front of you. Um, and the cool thing about this is this is done autonomously on our machine. And what I mean by that is we start by taking a picture of the randomly oriented grid of atoms. Then we have a program that goes and examines the picture and figures out the series of moves that need to be played in order to move the atoms into this five by five uniform grid. Uh, and basically that, that series of moves is, is figured out by something called a compression algorithm. There are three different options for doing this and we've chosen this one. And once you do that, you then just basically translate those moves into RF tones that are played on your AODs. And then you can watch that happen in front of you as we're doing this GIF. So once we get this five by five array, we're then ready to start thinking about quantum computing because we have basically a register of qubits. And so the next thing we wanna think about is how are we gonna do single qubit gates on this platform? And the answer is, you know, we, you know, so here's our qubit. Let's start by talking about that. We have the two lowest levels on our nuclear spin, uh, in our nuclear spin manifold uh, at the bottom of this diagram, the blue levels. And basically we wanna go from the lower level to the upper level and then bounce back and forth. Normally you could just drive this transition directly, but we wanna do something slightly more clever where we do this roundabout trip with a two photon transition. And importantly, the, the photons are optical uh, wavelengths or optical energy scale. So 689 nanometers is the wavelength. If we do a two photon transition, we can also move the qubit between the two ground states. This is beneficial because one, it lets us achieve single side addressing uh, and two, it lets us drive the gate potentially much faster. Now, I just wanna note that we're able to do this uh, on Phoenix with single site addressing already. <clears throat> and this, this GIF here with this NSF logo is showing how we make individual spots of light uh, in a sort of arbitrary way. Um, 
in the future, what we want to do is take the optical system that does this and sort of integrate it, create a photonic, integrated photonic platform for it so that the system is much smaller. Uh, and so we're working on this with an academic partner on this peak program that's sponsored by the NSF. But taking a step back from the integrated photonics, we do have a sort of conventional optical system that lets us do single site addressing. And so using that system, we've already been able to do some nice demos of our single qubit gate performance. So on the top right, you can see a measurement of randomized benchmarking using our native gate set. And over there, we're seeing greater than 99% single qubit gate fidelity. And importantly, we're driving gates in, or driving atoms in parallel while, while doing this measurement, which is, I think, pretty exciting. Um, the other thing is we can achieve very long coherence times with our, with our uh, choice of qubit, the nuclear spin ground states. And so in the plot on the bottom, you can see that we're seeing coherent oscillations over many orders of magnitude uh, in time, going all the way out to uh, about 20 or 30 seconds in this data, actually about 30, uh, 30 seconds or so, but the fit is, is giving us greater than 40 second coherence time. So the long coherence time is potentially really powerful because when we think about error correction, or just anything involving classical computation in the middle, it'd be nice to give, us, give ourselves a little bit of time to do that computation, then come back to the quantum computing side and continue doing operations. We also did a measurement of our qubit, uh, which we call the T1 measurement. This is basically a measure of uh, how much your, your, your qubit states decay just by themselves if you leave them alone. And what you see here is that if we put atoms in the upper state, which is the blue data, or the lower state, which is the, the red data on the bottom, there's no obvious sign of decay in this data, even going out to five seconds where we're holding the qubits. Uh, and I just want to point out that even other neutral atom systems, which are generally pretty stable, you don't necessarily have this length of coherence time uh, guaranteed. Uh, the, the reason we've kind of been able to do this is because we are using a very well-protected nuclear spin qubit uh, in an alkaline earth atom. Okay, so we talked about sort of how we work with qubits, how we manipulate qubits uh, on Phoenix. And now I want to sort of transition that over to how we turn this into a quantum computing platform. So talking about software and automation, um, I want to start by with the sort of what I consider the centerpiece of our software stack, which is the Klingon programming language. This is, this is something that we've uh, sort of written in-house at Atom. So say you have some abstract quantum circuit you've written in a third-party language, the diagrams on the right here. Uh, we you know, can translate this into Klingon using this very Pythonic looking code on the right. And that then gets compiled into a series of RF pulses that get played on the AODs or the actuators uh, in our system. And in addition, that gets combined uh, with a general sequence orchestrator for our machine, which also takes care of things like loading atoms initially and measuring atoms at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the sequence. And at this point, everything beyond here is in the hardware realm. And I also want to note that everything above the Klingon compiler, compiler has been written in a way that's completely hardware agnostic. So if we have new machines you know, that are slightly improved or, or, or slightly different, this still applies. OK, so we've done a nice demo combining Klingon and our single qubit gate platform. And I want to just run through that quickly on this slide. So in the GIF here, you can see that we're able to play spots of light column by column or row by row uh, in parallel. Uh, and so we're using that in our Klingon, our, in our Klingon architecture. And on the right, uh, you can see uh, a, de a, a demonstration that, that is actually using these features. So uh, each column in the data that you see on the right, the red data, those, the, for each column, the atom was driven simultaneously. And so we drive a column, we move to the next one, drive that one, we move to the next one and drive that one. And importantly, what you'll notice is that in a given column, you see an oscillation frequency that's about the same for all the, all the individual qubits, but there's a phase offset to each of these oscillations, which if you look at the circuit directly above, it corresponds to a different Z gate um, for each of these qubits. So what this is telling you is that we're driving gates in parallel to atoms individually, but we're applying different Z gates to them at the same while this is occurring. So in, in short, we're driving single side gates in parallel to atoms, which is a, a powerful capability when we scale up our architecture. We're also able to do things like robust phase estimation for gate tune-up and gate set tomography for evaluating our gates. And these, I'll, I'll just say that these are uh, you know, well-known tools from the quantum characterization, validation, verification community. And uh, you know, we might be one of the first 
sort of neutral atom platforms to be uh, be running these tools on our machine. So, uh, you know, I think that's kind of cool. We also uh, have to, you know, since this is, uh, you know, a real machine, we need to worry about how we monitor it and also how we calibrate it. And so on the left, I'm showing you uh, basically a database-backed uh, environmental, environmental monitoring system, which we're sort of displaying using Grafana, this like web service. Um, and this is just, you know, displayed on a big screen in our office at all times, so we can keep track of what's going on. But you can also access it through your own computer if you need to. We also have a fair use job queue on the upper right and some nice tools for debugging sequences uh, if you're not sure what's going on and you want to look at the timing of individual pulses. Uh, in our job queue, I want to point out one of the users, which is called Calibration Runner. Now, this is a system that runs calibrations automatically for us. So this is another really powerful tool, I feel. Um, on this slide, I'm, I'm showing you kind of a graphical representation of that calibration runner, where basically it starts with calibrations that you see at the top, and it goes down the tree in, this, in the dependency that's shown here. Uh, and so importantly, these are calibrations that a, a human is never involved in. They just, they just run on the machine by themselves, and they'll do things like take data, fit the data, and you know, go and update some uh, calibrated value if it needs to be changed. So let's take a let's take a second to think about the future, right? So uh, with that, let's let's talk about two qubit gates and neutral atom systems. So in this plot here, um, you're seeing two qubit gate performance versus time for three different uh, qubit uh, physical qubits. So trapped ions, superconducting qubits, and neutral atoms. Uh, I'll point out just two things about this. One is that neutral atoms uh, have appeared sort of later in the scene, five to ten years later than both these technologies. And number two is that the two qubit gate performance has really been improving wildly over the last five to ten, or over the last five or so years. And really, this has been driven by technical improvements to laser power, laser phase noise, and also techniques people use to clean up their lasers. Okay. Now, all these data points are based on something called the Rydberg interaction uh, between pairs of neutral atoms. And so, I just want to emphasize in this diagram here that you know we are also pursuing the Rydberg interaction based two qubit gate. And I'm not going to say a whole lot more about it, except to just note that you know we're also using a two-photon transition for this for this gate, and there's a lot of overlap between the way we do this versus the way we do single qubit gates. Forgetting about the last few years, even just the last couple of months, it's also been a pretty exciting time for mutual atoms. Uh, on alkaline earth systems, we've seen the creation of long-lived uh, Bell states, or you know highly entangled states. Uh, universal gate set demonstrations, very fast single qubit gates. And on another type of atom, an alkali atom, we've seen uh, some nice demonstrations of you know, uh, mid-circuit rearrangement that has enabled uh, the creation of small error correcting codes, like, for example, surface codes. So this is all to say that you know, neutral atoms are very much entering the scene right now, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's exciting time. So um, uh, with that, I'll just say thank you for your attention. Um, you know, this is a, an image of the team from last summer, and we've hired a whole bunch more people since then. Um, and yeah, I just want to uh, also note that like, if you want to contact us, feel free to reach out to these people um, or me directly. Uh, and with that, I'll just wrap up. Thank you for your attention.